and just a delight to have our friendship. Uh, yes, you're right. I think confusion is probably uh, systemic in our world today and it's not particular to any one culture no matter where I go. In fact, the greatest percentage of our audiences is really among the young, mm -hmm. be it universities or high schools or whatever, because that's a questioning stage in life. And uh, there's a Chinese proverb that says, if you want to know what water is, don't ask the fish. When you're so immersed in something, oftentimes you really don't even think of a counter perspective or you don't think of questioning what your environment is about. But the interesting thing is you may be immersed externally in something, but internally you cannot run away from what keeps on haunting you. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you're right, born in the city of Chennai, India, it used to be called Madras at that time, but a few years ago was changed to, changed to Chennai, Bombay was changed to Mumbai. I have to keep up with all of this. Uh, raised in that southern city, my mother was born and raised in Chennai. My dad came from deeper south in the state of Kerala, and they met in Chennai and were married there. Uh, so my dad spoke Malayalam, my mother spoke Tamil, I was raised in Delhi and spoke Hindi. I often say I can speak Hindi and Tamil, Malayalam, I only knew the scolding words my dad used, mm -hmm. so I don't use them in public. Mm -hmm. But Chennai was my home city till I was uh, very young, three or four, and then moved to Delhi. But the thing is, John, people don't realize that India is probably the most religious country in the world. People are pursuing answers through ceremony, through historical pursuit of tradition, and all that comes along with religion. Technically speaking, Hindu scholars will say there are 330 million deities in the pantheon of Hinduism. Now, only a handful of them are really followed very diligently uh, by people in India. But in that culture, having the, had the privilege of an ancestry that went back to the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood, which was uh, the Nambudris. My dad was from Kerala, my mom from Chennai, as I said. But I never really thought seriously about religious things. Why? I was immersed in the struggle to perform academically. India is a very competitive culture in academics. If you don't make it in your studies, you're going to go nowhere. So the pressure is on you from every side. Big time not, the pressure is on students there. Yeah, and not just enough to pass. It had to be high, you had to be right at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to make it. Cricket was in my blood, I played cricket and tennis. I loved the sports field, hated the academic side of it, and ultimately it got me into serious trouble with my father. I wasn't going to make it. And that confusion of pursuit and the need for acceptance. Another thing about India is it's a shame-oriented culture. If you don't do that well, then uh, you're shamed into trying to be successful. The highest rate of suicides in India is immediately after the examination results are posted in the newspapers. All over the country, kids are jumping off buildings, pouring kerosene on themselves and burning themselves. This, my, my closest friend did this to himself. So that was the really the culture within which I was born and raised and struggled. My brothers and sisters were all doing well. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was sort of the failure of the family and that finally got to me. Yeah. I've been to Mumbai, I'm going back to uh, Calcutta, and I watched people very sincerely following whichever religion they were practicing. So they were sincere, but they're still confused. They still don't have the answer. They're still searching. Talk about that a little bit. Yes, uh, the major religions in India, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism, you've got a touch of Baha'ism, all of that. Christianity forms a small percentage of it. And people, you know, often think that sort of Christianity is this exclusivist worldview. No, no, not true. All of them are exclusivistic. Every one of them is exclusivistic. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been founded. They're founded for a purpose, certainly with certain distinctives. And in the search for answers, I just ended up with none whatsoever. And uh, the emptiness, the loneliness, and the failure in school, you know, all I didn't have a single Christian friend, by the way. They were all, uh, major majority of them from the Hindu worldview. 
which places such great value and respect for family and all of that. So that's the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. But the emptiness came in with no answers, only questions. Tradition, tradition, tradition. You followed it. I knew this was not going to get me anywhere. And finally, I attempted to take my own life. Yeah, talk about that. How did you do that? Well, you know, for many years, I couldn't, John, to be honest with you. Uh, as long as my dad was, uh, dad and mom were alive, it was very embarrassing for them till my father in his latter years, point blank, asked my wife to talk about it and then asked me. Uh, it was, it's again the shame thing, you know, mm -hmm. you don't, nobody wants to admit how low they had become alive. I just want to assure the listener it had nothing to do with any psychological debilitation, no such issues with drugs or whatever like that. It was just a search for meaning. I wanted to put life together and it wasn't coming together for me. So I was going to my class in college and went into the science lab out there, uh, saw some chemicals, took these plastic bags. I didn't even know what all they said except I took the ones that was marked poison, mm -hmm. brought it back to my home, put it in a glass of water early one morning. Everybody was out of the house. One to went into the restroom, restroom and just it started to froth immediately, effervesce. So I just stirred it with a teaspoon and got the thing down. I, I used to tell my story in the early days by saying, unfortunately, but a doctor corrected me once. He said, you better say fortunately. It was very salty. And my system began to reject it. And there I was holding on to the sink as the moisture was coming out of my body. I collapsed on my knees. I shouted for help. The servant in the house heard me screaming. Nobody else was there. He came, I don't know whether he broke the door down, pushed it down, I don't remember exactly, but he saw me in that pitiful state, put me into a taxi and rushed me to a hospital. And when I was fully composed of my senses again, all I knew was needles were in my arm because of the dehydration, my mother and father by my side, and the ultimate desolation of knowing you didn't even know how to live, now you didn't know how to die. That was the crossing road moment for me in asking questions more seriously than I had been asking. But a man came into your room and did what? Well, this is the amazing thing to me. That's why I believe in sort of divine appointments. I wasn't looking for anybody to come. In fact, I still don't know how they let him get that past that right. much, probably because he said he was a minister. And he brought a little red New Testament and wanted to read it to me. And my mother said he couldn't, I was in critical condition. So he opened it to the 14th chapter of John. And ironically, it's Jesus talking to Thomas, the first person who ever went to India with the gospel. Mm -hmm. And he was reaching the Nambudris, by the way, mm -hmm. my very ancestors from centuries ago. And in that 14th chapter of John, as Jesus was saying, because I live, you shall live also. I grasped onto that verse and said, Jesus, if you are offering me life like I have never had it, I want that life from you. That was the turning point for me. I never really prayed any meaningful prayer. And I invited Jesus Christ, the author of life, to give me the life that he alone could give. Aged 17. And the Bible handed over to my mother. I couldn't hold it because, my, as I said, the dehydration had set in. So my mother, in her heavy accent, reading this to me, I prayed the prayer. And that was the beginning of a journey that has now continued with utter delight and perpetual novelty. Yes, twists and turns and ups and downs. But when you have the map of God in your own heart, you walk with him hand in hand.